I also think, you know, it's really rock and roll to hear performers and say, they're singing to me or they're singing, you know, my story. Is this something that uh, people also share back, kind of reflect back the autobiographical autobi tendency of the work? Absolutely. How many people, how many like, yeah, yeah. Oh my God! I mean, I've had like you know, eighty-year-old <laughs> Jewish women on the subway saying, "This is my story." You know, it doesn't matter who you are, and, yeah. and that's what's great. I love that. That would yeah. that would just kill me. Yeah, you know? we were kind of stunned because we really did think like this is. The, I mean, the real point for me. I mean, it, it changed, I guess. But I did wanna. I did wanna be like, okay, I want to tell a story about black people that hadn't been told before that we always knew had, was existing. All of my friends really exist. My family really exists. You really exist. You're not in your head. You exist, right? So it's like we were like, hey, let's just do, let's do this. Are you really going to let me take this to Broadway? Okay, this is what I want to do. If I get one shot, this is what I want to do. I want to tell this story that we all know has existed forever, but I want to tell it. But the funny part and the cool part was that, like she says, we had these, these ladies with blue hair would show up. And we'd and be like, it's my story. And I'd, I'd be like, oh, that's very nice. She, she'd be like, no, you know, like, in 1947, I was the shit. I was a fucking rebel rouser, and I left Wisconsin. And I moved to the Lower East Side, and I raised hell. And I'm like, so this really was your story? She's like, yes. You know, and it's like, okay, so you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, it was the truth, you know? I mean, we really kind of stumbled upon it. We didn't, we didn't think it was going to be all universal in the beginning. We really didn't, you know, and I think our producers were worried that it wasn't universal enough, but it actually is. They just, producers are always, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to play another song from Passing Strange, and this is what opens up uh, the setting moving to Berlin. Okay. Um, so we're going to open uh, with this. Okay. out. I'm not, I'm, I, I applaud you because no one ever pulls out that one. Yeah. Everyone pretty much hates that one. I love it, but I'm glad you like it. What is your history with Berlin? <sighs> or ongoing history, I guess, is more appropriate. Yeah, I had no urge to go to Berlin when I left New York. I met a, a German guy and we were all like, yeah, let's form a band, let's go to London. And we went to London, and me and my friends from LA, and this German guy, and a guy from New York, we all kind of just said, we're gonna tour through Europe, and we didn't have any money. And so we just said, we're gonna bum around. And you know, we wanted to be in London, and that got, that got boring. Then we wanted to be in Amsterdam, and that was fun, but almost too fun. And, <laughs> and it's amazing what you think you want, and then when you have it, like all of it, it can get boring in like three days. In, and then we were like, well, where do we go? And he was like, well, there's this flat we can live in in Berlin for a month. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm so not into like Berlin. I want to go to the south. I've seen all these French movies. You know, I was really into Godard, you know, and French New Wave. And even the Italians, I'm into that, you know. And the guys were like, no, we can't go to Italy because everyone lives with their parents. I'm like, okay, we're not going to go to Italy. <laughs> but um, let's go to France or something, man. Just something southern and like, really soulful, you know. It's like, no, man, we're going to Berlin. That's where... That's where the empty flat is for a month. So we went to Berlin and we're completely, you know, the wall was still up and we were just, um, there is something to having a wall around a place that's kind of comforting actually. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's oddly comforting. It seems like it's going to be scary when you first go in. It's like, you know, you see the East German guard and he's really, really kind of the scariest guy you've ever met because you've never seen a person that pale you know, 
and he's just looking at you in a way where like the entire Cold War is just like resting in his eyes, you know? <laughs> and he looks at you, and he really does look at you in a way that when people say like a withering look, like you do kind of shrink a bit. When you first get that first look from that East German guard, you know, he just looks like, and you, you later on realize the look means something a little bit different. It's more complex what that look means. But you get to Berlin and you're kind of like, oh, woo. And everything is there. Everything you need is in Berlin. The government, the, when I was in Berlin, we were getting more arts money in the city, not the country, in the city of Berlin was receiving more arts money than the NEA was giving the entire United States. Berlin is that big. You all know how big the US is. You would go into a club in Berlin that would look like some place that was bombed out and it would have a PA system that was top of the line because the government would give you a PA system if you had a space. All you had to do was write a little paragraph saying, I'm starting an art space, I need a PA system. So it was this kind of paradise for making work, you know, in this kind of way where like we didn't, we didn't understand where we were, you know, and people were squatting and not getting arrested like people were squatting houses, but like the, we're not, we didn't understand, like if we did this in the States, we'd get, you know, the cops would come. We didn't, all these things that we just didn't understand that seemed, you know, to, to, to innocent eyes, you know, like paradise really, you know, for artists, you know. So we, we had a corner, the, one of the busiest corners in Kreuzberg, this area in, Germ in Berlin. We were sitting around with these guys who were these left-wing sort of construction worker guys, and we said, It'd be really great to have a performance space on this corner. This is just a burned out corner. There's nothing on this corner except le weeds and dirt. It'd be great to just like, and they were like, well, we couldn't do it because, you know, uh, how would we get the electricity? And these German guys looked at us and goes, we'll steal the electricity from the restaurant next door. And the next week we had a prefabricated performance space built on that grass. And we performed there every week for an entire summer. And I mean, again, these are just things that we wouldn't have been able to do in the United States, you know, or in other parts of Germany, really. Kreuzberg was this very special little zone, a little too Turkish, a little too arty, a little too poor, you know. You know, it's all changed now, you know. But I mean, I'm just saying, this, this is, it looked like paradise, you know. And all that intensity, Berlin just kind of has this kind of intensity that, you know, I can't really describe, but it, and it's still intense and it's still great. In but it's sort of like, I just want to say also, media, the people there were also like very political, like a lot of the people there were, who weren't, if you weren't an artist, a lot of people, most of the people were very, very, in my clique, very political. So some of them were even associated with people in the Red Army faction. So you had these people that were kind of living their lives according to their ideals, whereas back in America, we always had these ideas that we thought we could never really live. And then we met people who were actually living according to the ideas they had. And they were like, well, if you don't like apartheid, don't buy these products or boycott this. You know, boycotting was like, you know what I mean? Just all these kind of things, like here's how you actually live by your ideals. And so that was what influenced this kid. I didn't take it to, be, to mean I wanted to become a very, very, very political person. I took it to mean I want to be an artist because they taught me to live by my ideas, you know? So when I saw a guy on the, in front of cops throwing a Molotov cocktail at a policeman, I didn't translate that into, I want to do that. I don't want to put, I don't put, won't put my life on the line like that, but I do want to put my life on the line by being an artist because face it, it's almost like the same thing. In the musical, uh, the Berlin Wall is represented by just a yellow line, a yellow light behind you. Um, but then it also shows up uh, in the lyrics. What is the significance of the Berlin Wall in Passing Strange? I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I think, it, I think we, I think, I think uh, Kevin. Um, I was gonna say, what yellow line? We're never looking back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that, Stu? It's actually true, it's yeah, like, I, I saw it in the movie once. <laughs> but I, 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 I mean, I know that Kevin did an amazing job on the lights and that, that for him, the Berlin Wall, yeah, it was just like yellow line. For me, it was just this like, like this huge sort of like, the thing that you can take, like I said, the thing that you, the contradiction, right? How you can live 
live in this really kind of grotesque but also beautiful contradiction. I mean, you're walking around every day in a place where people can't leave. But you're like having a drink with your girlfriend. And you're, something that got cut from the play was this thing that me and the director always like, I think you liked it also, where the, the, the protagonist would be like taking, a, he, he had this litany of things like, oh yeah, he does say it, at the point where he's like, you know, he's walking with his girlfriend in the morning, bump into the wall. Have a nice breakfast with someone and talk about a cool song you're gonna write and then bump into the wall, you know? Have a wonderful spring walk and bump into the wall. Like, you could not forget what we do, I think as Americans, what we do pretty well, right? Forget. Berlin doesn't let you forget. And they still don't let you forget. The wall never lets you forget that it was more to it than just your sort of, you know, late capitalist sort of paradise, you know? The wall constantly reminded you of what? about 80 million things. That people are suffering, that there's politics, that politics is real, that people are actually living in situations, not just this faraway concept of like, you know, it's Africa and I really don't know what that means because it's far enough away where all I have to do is put a dollar in an envelope and then it's gonna be, everything's gonna be fine. And I'm gonna feel better. The wall doesn't make you feel better. You kind of have to just deal with it. It's there and it becomes, it, it sits on you. You kind of wear it. You know, you kind of have to wear it. And, and wearing the wall is, I think, what, makes, what made me feel more alive and more conscious because it didn't allow me to forget. Uh, it didn't allow me to forget in the way that maybe other places would. And even now, the Germans are obsessed with remembering. Now in Berlin, they have this thing that's kind of amazing. They put gold cobblestones in front of homes and you'll walk out of your house one day and see a cobblestone and it'll have a name on it and it'll be the name of a person that was taken from your home to a concentration camp. The date that they were taken and where they were taken to. So in front of my ex-wife's house, my, where my daughter lives and I visit them all the time, there's these three gold cobblestones that have the names of these three people who were taken from this home. So, right, that home's not a home anymore. That home is now a place of memorial, a place of remembrance, you know, and they're, they're very much obsessed with remembering. I think that's something that we should be obsessed with also, you know. And there's a lot of debate about the language to use, and I know that for those stumble stones, the question of, you know, was this person murdered? Right, versus, right, absolutely. Was this person um, yeah, disappeared yeah, yeah. as something yeah. else comes Absolutely. Out. It's just a very different way of, you know, I mean, it's just a, such a, couldn't be a more different place, you know, especially for an American kid from Los Angeles, you know, to just have to remember things that are dark, you know. Um, Heidi, I want to talk to you about what you experience on stage, um, because in some, you know, you're also leading, you're not the narrator, but um, you're also leading, and I'm thinking about the song Come Down Now, and maybe this is this moment where the youth is either bumping into the wall or, or would have happened that way. Definitely. Um, and I wanted to play a recording, but actually the, the cast recording doesn't capture the point counterpoint um, between you singing and... Uh, yeah, I can't remember the cast recording what we do. Yeah, I'm trying to remember how we recorded it. It's, it's different than the... Than we the actually just hear, hear your words. Well, oh, uh, maybe we... Do you want to... Should we listen to a little bit and just maybe talk about that moment? Sure, sure. Listening is waiting Listening is waiting Now you are knee deep in your head's footnotes And your eyes are closing I'll take your complex out of context and you can stop your posing. I believe. 